Manio Macaria, Muta Guraibu, Nagasani, Tansan, Certainly one needs a retreat from the daily task of working with people. On the mission, however, my free time is only free in theory. In practice, it is free from my everyday work with people in church or in the office. But it is filled with some form of manual labor, be it carpentry, welding or gardening. Naturally, it relaxes from a psychological standpoint, but on the other hand, it is specific work. Strictly speaking, I have very little free time. Let me say that it is a steady march from one holiday to another, with no rest in between. One of the most difficult aspects of missionary work is coming to terms with your own inabilities and with the fact that many things must wait completion. You do what you can day to day and the rest will someday be completed, but this remainder will only gradually be completed after our death. Without a vehicle, working here would be impossible because our job requires coordinating groups of laity in the field. There are two priests in a parish numbering 50,000 spread over mountainous terrain. You have to travel by vehicle. You could walk from time to time, but this would mean that I reach a place like this not once during the week, but once in two, three months, and the rest concentrates around the parish headquarters. At the moment, we own this small pickup. The odometer reads almost 144,200 kilometers. A considerable amount of that was traveled on these bumpy roads. So you can imagine that in a year's time, it will start falling apart. And then we will have to find another vehicle. From this hilltop, we can almost see the entire parish. The size in kilometers would be 15 by 20, but you have to calculate differently because we are in the mountains. The boundary of the parish reaches this stretch of lake, which enters this chain of hills, and looking from there, that entire land belongs to our parish. These islands that you see, they also belong to our parish. There are a few Catholic families who live on the far island. However, on the other island, there are a few families present, but none are Catholic. During the rainy season, it is impossible to reach this place by car. Then you either walk or ride a bicycle. There are similar stretches of land alongside the volcano, where it is difficult or at times impossible for a vehicle to cross. Northern Rwanda was engulfed with fighting until 1999. A specifically bloody time was 1998 when these high mountains were under the control of partisans. During that time, the loss of lives was enormous. It usually happens during the night when you would only hear the artillery, the screams and the movement of people. All war is unjust, and never do you have on one side innocent lambs and on the other ravenous wolves. The loss these people felt during that time is substantial. 
There is a large percentage of widows and orphans here. People were taken from our parish, as well as the neighboring parish. It is unpleasant to recall those days. We can but rejoice that they have passed. There were priests killed at the time, yes. This is the second of our big schools. For a long time, renovation here was impossible, as was reaching this place because of the fighting. At the moment, we have received funds from the Polish embassy, which will aid us in the renovations of half of the school. That is four to five classes. We received an additional 2,000 euros from Germany, and the rest we have to find elsewhere. When we finish the first phase, we will look for money to complete the second phase. Our schools and churches are in a bad shape. From 1999 until 2000, many of the areas right along the border or close to the volcano could not be reached because of security. That is why we could finally hit the ground running after the year 2000. Many of the schools are in shambles. We do what we can to fix them up or simply raise new buildings altogether. The same applies to our churches. The faithful often find themselves in buildings constructed of poles stuck into the ground, the walls made from mud bricks and the roof from scrap metal. If you cheat a white man here, it is not a sin but a credit if you can get away with it. For example, to build one classroom modestly but solidly, we spend about 3,000 euros. But a local contractor here will charge at least five to 6,000. The great majority of these local contractors try to charge as much as possible, getting the most profit from the construction. They will add, let's say, the correct amount of sand and water, but not the cement. The consequences are piteous. The fact that the roof can crash in on these kids or on the people in church does not trouble them at all. It is only vital that the time of completion be met, the guarantee time pass, but what happens after that is not important to them. It is a given that the white man is wealthy. Worst case scenario, he will build again. The help that we receive for these constructions is insufficient. Very seldom do we receive the amount that we ask for. And this is the entire problem, to build something inexpensively and at the same time solidly. This is the sixth grade. They are copying what is on the blackboard. Then their lesson will continue. We have nine grades here, before there were only four, and all this was open and in ruins. This is a simple construction, this part's for the boys. Here you have six spaces like this, and six on the other side, so that is twelve. Later, we will think of building another with 12 spaces. Over there, you can see the old latrine, which was for 1,500 kids. We budgeted for two elements here, the building of the school and simultaneously a sanitary facility. You know, if you walk out of the classroom and with every other step you are in poop, it is not pleasant. Not to mention that the smell is gross and the high...